good evening, everyone. I'm Dibyesh, Dibyesh Anand. My preferred pronouns are he and him. I'm University of Westminster professor here, professor of international relations, and also have different roles here. You don't need to know about me because you are not here to listen to me, but I'm the host here, so you have no option but to actually listen to me. Now, uh, this event is part and parcel of uh, what we call Westminster Conversations. Now, we focus on contemporary anti-Semitism, but we have had various events on racism, anti-black racism, on disability, ableism, we have had on misogyny, we have had on all kinds of issues. What we recognize within our university is, of course, that EDI, equality, diversity, inclusion is very important, but it's not a thing in itself. It's not a thing that you can achieve, it is a process. So we need a process through which change can be brought about within institutions, but within the society. So no point imagining like an oasis, an institution that's perfect, unless society also changes. Now, what can any university or what can any place, any institution do on its own? Not much. But rather than think that we can't do much, we also need to think we can do our bit and of course work with others to bring about that societal transformation. And when we say societal, we don't only mean our society here, whichever here is, it could be London for you, it could be UK for you, it could still be Europe for some of you, and it could still be globe for you, right? But for us, it's very important that we are part of change in the world, in this world. Now, conversation, part of it, of course, is why conversations? Why not action? As I'm an academic, many of you are, some of you might not be, and I know sometimes non-academics get impatient. They want action all the time. But do remember that action without thinking is a disaster in most cases. Now, of course, words without action is also not very meaningful. But we do need both thinking and doing. So while within our university and other universities we are focusing a lot on doing, we also want conversations because we do know that many issues are not as simple as it's made out to be. It's, we can say, oh, look, we want to counter anti-Semitism. We are all non-racist or we want to be anti-racist. And yet, we also have to remember that many people who might be racist or say racist things while think they're not racist. And same is with anti-Semitism. Majority of people I have encountered whose views many of us will see as anti-Semitic will see themselves as not anti-Semitic. And this is the challenge which you face when it comes to equality, diversity, inclusion. It's not a thing that you can easily identify then challenge it. It is part of life. And because, of course, all of these things are connected to prejudices, stereotypes people have. Stereotypes and prejudices, then that turn into bigotry, and then, of course, can turn into something worse. Now, today, of course, focus on contemporary anti-Semitism. Uh, it could also be historical part. I'm sure some of you might cover or hint at it. The reason focuses on contemporary is because a lot of time, when we talk of anti-Semitism, when I do with my own students, by the way, generally people are aware of Holocaust. So there's almost a focus almost always on Holocaust. Of course, there are people who deny Holocaust even now, and we know it, so let's not talk of them. We are talking of those who will recognize that what happened during Holocaust was evil and wrong. Yet, they will not see it as something of the present. So it's something like past, not present. And it's very important that we have conversations because while in media or in public discourse there is focus on anti-Sim now, it has always been there and it might be there and therefore what are the ways in which we can talk about it, think about it, and then hopefully plan about challenging it. And not hopefully plan, but we should challenge it. Now at Westminster University, as I said, we are very committed to challenging all forms of prejudices, celebrating diversities, in terms of, of course, in this context, challenging anti-Semitism, and celebrating, if we have to focus on this particular aspect, celebrating all forms of Jewish lives, because we need to do both. We have to challenge prejudices and celebrate lives positively. That's part of it, right? Now, the reason I'm here is because, of course, I've worked with some of you to organize this. I'm also one of the person leading this Westminster conversations, including various things on racism. I've been doing that. Uh, you don't need introduction to me, as I said. Um, and I can talk of that maybe during question answer again if you want. And if you have any questions related to university approach, etc., I'm quite a frank person, sometimes too frank. So I have to sometimes think, am I speaking as an institution or not? But it doesn't matter because people, my colleagues and my students trust me so I can say what I want, right, freely. And that's something rare, by the way, in institutions. So we can have that discussion. Now, 
one more thing on anti-Semitism, and I will give you my experience. I was saying to them that it's a learning experience for me. It is a learning experience because, of course, no one is born a racist. No one is certainly born an anti-racist. All of us have our own journeys. I always see myself as anti-racist, challenging prejudices, and my work is on that, by the way, on Islamophobia, on all kinds of things. But in my own life, I remember years ago, I would use certain terms in, I've chaired sessions on Israel, Palestine, you know, all of that. And you know, I'm someone seen a very pro-Palestinian, challenging, you know, Israeli occupation, etc. And I do that. Yet, what I learned in recent years, also, of course, is the importance of language. I recall years ago, and I'm quite ashamed of that, but I also know it's not enough to say, oh, I'm so sorry about that, because it's about learning. Is using sometimes the Nazi parallel to refer to Israel. That I is unacceptable and that's insensitive, both. I learned that and I say that freely because of course, if we don't acknowledge our own journey, then I don't think we are being honest to ourselves. But when I've started thinking more on anti-Semitism, I have lost friends. I think why would I have lost, but I've lost friends, I've lost comrades, scholars who'd work with me on various things. And for me that, and that and something else. Whenever I speak on anti-Semitism or write on it on Twitter, including on the fact that I have strongly support adoption of IHRA working definition. I know it's problematic, I know it's filled with challenges, it's not simple, but I do it and I write about it. Many people do it, but they don't write about it. Once I wrote, I've seen the uh, subtext of criticism I receive, which is ultimately saying that there's someone behind me making me do it. Now, for those of you who are Jewish, or who, are awareing, who are aware of this, you know what that someone means, essentially, the hidden hand, the powerful something else. That itself is an educational experience for me because all I know is there's no one behind me. Not I know, I know no one behind me. This is my idea, this is my passion, this is my politics. Right? That's what I'm saying to yourself. But I wanted to share that with you because in the spirit of being reflective and open, I wanted to be open and say that I'm aware that this is not just another conversation on anything else, but this is one conversation on which I found so many otherwise anti-racist good kind of people wanting to step back. That's what my experience has been. Anyway, that's my experience. It's not about my experience. So what the format we are going to follow, we have three speakers. I've asked each one of them, starting with Keith, Daniel, and then Daniel. Uh, they'll get extra minute to introduce themselves rather than me introducing them. So they'll each have now 13 minutes rather than 12 minutes, uh, 13 minutes to sp say something, then I have a couple of questions for them, then a conversation here. Now we are recording this session for some, and we'll not show your face by the way, so you're okay with it. But for some reason, if you want to ask a question, you don't, uh, you're not being seen, but if you don't even want to be to recorded your question, just raise your hand and we'll try to not record you, right? But we have to record it because ultimately the purpose is not only conversation here, but to give out a message and that conversation will continue, and whatever we do, we'll continue to challenge racism, prejudices, anti-Semitism. Thank you so much, and on that note, let me pass it on to Keith first. Thanks very much, and thank you very much for organizing this event, and um, I think it's a great thing to do, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, my name's Keith Khan harris I teach part-time at Birkbeck College. I also teach at Learbeck College, which is the Progressive Rabbinic Seminary, and I am a fellow of the Institute for Jewish Policy Research, and I also write books, including my 2019 book, Strange H, which I actually have copies of, which if, if anybody wants to buy one, uh, but rest assured what I'm going to be saying now is not just a plug for the book. In fact, a lot of this is not in the book at all. I'm going to start the conversation off by uh, my talk off by asking the question, how significant is anti-Semitism today? How significant is it as a social phenomena, a political phenomena, and how much of a threat is it to Jews and also to other people? And of course, this, uh, this, this sort of question could be answered in many ways, but I want to first of all say that we, my whole line on anti-Semitism today is to say something that should be obvious but actually is not obvious uh, and, rarely do, and is sometimes not done, and that is that we cannot consider anti-Semitism today without considering how Jews and Jews' allies experience and respond to it. 
Now, to some extent, as I say, that sounds obvious, but a lot of, a lot of writing on anti-Semitism has said, well, actually, anti-Semitism isn't about Jews at all. It's about non-Jewish people who hate Jews. It's about their perception of Jews, which is true to an extent. But, of course, it's a bad thing because it makes Jewish life very, very difficult, amongst other things. But also, and here's the really important here, in a lot of co controversies about anti-Semitism today, you find Jews on both sides. <laughs> you find Jews defending people from accusations of anti-Semitism. You find Jews accusing people of anti-Semitism. So a lot of the time, the way anti-Semitism works today is it's a kind of a, 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 a intra-Jewish conflict that is exacerbated by what I call in the book selectivity, which is selecting the good Jews over the bad Jews and coming to the aid of the good Jews and shunning the bad Jews. But that's not my main focus today. What I want to talk about, uh, first of all, is how, how we can, uh, is, is to make the point that Jews today are not what they were. <laughs> Jews today have in the world far more agency than they ever used to have. That's partly because there is a Jewish state, which is a regional superpower. It's also because in many, but not all countries, Jews have been upwardly mobile, have plenty of political contacts. They don't control the political system, but they are politically networked, or at least some of their self-appointed uh, representatives are. And... I don't think that this admission of Jewish agency necessarily means that anti-Semitism impos is impossible, but it does confuse things. Because there's a kind of paradox, it's a paradox of security, that the more secure Jews are, the more empowered and emboldened they feel to speak about anti-Semitism. And this is confusing to some people. In fact, particularly on the left, although not exclusively, the ability of Jews to exercise agency in the world and to act independently of other allies is seen as evidence of the lack of significance of anti-Semitism. Because if anti-Semitism was a serious thing, well, they need us. They wouldn't be able to do this on their own. And this has real major consequences for how anti-Semitism uh, uh, works today. Because Jews have that agency, Jews often have the confidence to make large claims about anti-Semitism, some of which don't really hold up to scrutiny. But I'm not going to say that that's because Jews are wrong about anti-Semitism. I'm going to qualify that in a moment. But there's a quote from Jonathan Sachs, the, the, uh, the late chief rabbi, who has said on multiple occasions that the hate that begins with Jews never ends with the Jews. Another quote that you might have heard, uh, might have heard first they came for the Jews by Pastor, ne uh, Pastor Niemöller. However, and I'm really ashamed of this, really ashamed of this, the actual original bit of that quote is first they came for the communists, but the way it's often been repeated by Jews is first they came for the Jews and then they came for everyone else. And that's an interesting sign of how there is a sense among Jews that we need to, to make these claims for a kind of primacy. Anti-Semitism is sometimes mentioned as the canary in the coal mine. So the problem about anti-Semitism is we may be getting into the neck, but it's you next. It's the sign of a politically sick society, and what starts with the Jews will not end with the Jews. But I would say here that this desire for primacy is not necessarily pathological in itself, but it's a reflection of very deep-rooted and very understandable Jewish anxieties, particularly in the wake of the Holocaust, but not just the Holocaust, multiple other tragedies that have befallen the Jewish people over time. But it's also part of a general process of inflated political claims in the modern world. If you talk to anybody who is a single-issue campaigner, they will usually discursively try and inflate the primacy 
of their particular issue. That's particularly the case with things like animal rights protesters, for example. Or if you look at the trans, uh, trans issue, the, the protagonists are on there are often trying to, correct, to raise the profile because this is a very contested public sphere. It's a very crowded public sphere because now everybody has a voice. However, while that desire for primacy is very understandable, it does have consequences. Uh, it leads to a kind of analytical narrowness that often fails to see connections between anti-Semitism and other racisms, and it also makes anti-racist alliances much more difficult uh, because of the perception that Jews are muscling in on, uh, on our campaigns, if you like. It often can lead to tensions between groups, which is very unfortunate. So what is the place of anti-Semitism amongst other racisms, other hatreds, and other issues? First, they came for the Jews. First, the primacy thing may be untrue. But it's certainly true that Jews have been, and in some cases still are, the most discriminated against in some societies that have extensive networks of discrimination. So in medieval Europe, it was a highly unequal society. There were many groups who were othered. Jews may have get it worse in some respects than others within those kind of stratified, highly unequal societies. It's also true that anti-Semitism may be framed and manifested differently from other forms of racism and hatreds, particularly some tropes that you find with anti-Semitism you don't necessarily find in other racisms, particularly the modern emphasis on Jews being this powerful hidden hand who secretly control the world. That's not true. That sort of trope you don't find in, 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 all other ra in, in, in some other racisms at least. It's also true that anti-Semitism is in some societies very old and has very deep cultural roots, so deep that its tropes may not be recognizable to those who use them because they're just part of the cultural ether. For example, tropes about Jews and blood, which often happen when there is conflict in Israel, are often sell very close to the wind of repeating med medieval blood libels because these things are rooted in the sort of cultural bedrock in, our, in Western societies. However, despite this age, despite this rootedness, anti-Semitism is often seen as a coherent and complex ideological system, and it sometimes is. It's sometimes an entire worldview or the basis for it. However, I think there's an overestimation in many cases of this ideological coherence, which leads to a kind of flattening and treating all anti-Semitisms as a single ph phenomena, regardless of who is perpetrating them, regardless of their degree of agency uh, in, in the world. And I think that's highly problematic. And I think there's too little attention paid to sort of what, might, what one might call improvisational or maybe contingent forms of anti-Semitism. So much of the Labour anti-Semitism controversy, some of it was to do with people who'd been saying particular things for many, many years and had settled and coherent worldviews. But others, particularly anti-Semitism that happened online, was by people who had absolutely no track record in this area, but because of this sense of a project, a political project they supported being seen as under threat, suddenly you start dabbling in tropes about the Rothschilds that you only have the haziest sense of what they actually mean. So this is, a, it, it, now, I'll qualify that in a second. Another example of that is uh, of this interplay between the improvisational and the coherent is some forms of anti-Semitism in the Muslim world. There is a tradition of Muslim anti-Semitism. There's certainly a tradition of Jews and other minorities in Muslim societies being discriminated against in various ways. However, if you look at things like tropes about Jews, anti-Semitic tropes about Jews in many, although not all, Muslim countries, you will often find the importation of Western tropes about the Jews. For example, particularly Jews having black hats and beards, basically European Haredi, European origin Ashkenazi Jews being found in newspapers in places like Iran, where Iranian Jews never looked like that and still don't look like that. So there's that sense of, of, of incoherence and improvisation there. However, this, the, the anxiety that this, this improvisational causes 
the, part of the anxiety amongst Jews is that because of this, it's somehow lesser. And that therefore there is often a tendency to try and ascribe an ideological coherence to, to perhaps things that they're not. But again, I think this is really understandable because this insecurity isn't unwarranted. And they're, of course, to the perpetrator, to someone who suffers an anti-Semitic attack, it makes absolutely no difference whether somebody first thought about Jews five minutes before the attack or thought about it since, since all of their adult life, because for the perpetrator, that isn't necessarily significant, although it may be significant in how you deal with anti-Semitism. One of the questions is how and whether uh, improvisational anti-Semitism may lead eventually to a stronger ideological coherence. And one of the things I want to point to here is on the modern in parts of the US far right at the moment, anti-Semitism seems to be taking a more and more prominent role uh, within the sort of radicalized Republican right. And my view on that is the reason is it provides a kind of structure to a sort of nihilistic cynicism and post-truth rejection of more or less everything. So in this respect, my th I, I strongly suspect that it's not first they came for the Jews, it's eventually they came for the Jews because the Jews were the people who made everything else make sense, whether that's COVID or the January 6th election riots or whatever it else, else it is. Because if you land on anti-Semitism, you can find a pre-made structure that makes everything else make sense. So why pay attention to anti-Semitism? It's certainly true that in the UK at the moment, the main ways that anti-Semitism are manifest are generally not in terms of economic disadvantage or uh, deprivation and systematic discrimination in things like housing and the workplace. That's not to say it doesn't happen. It does happen, particularly with regard to strictly Orthodox Jews. However, the threat of verbal abuse and physical violence, it kind of doesn't make any difference how economically prosperous you might or might not be is still a horrible thing that nobody should have to go through. And also, one of the things that's really important in Jewish memory is the idea that security may not be a permanent state. I think one of the lessons of the Holocaust that many people have taken, justifiably in my view, is German Jews were the most assimilated and comfortable and culturally sophisticated Jewish minority probably in the world certainly up until the 1930s, and look what good it actually div did them. So how significant is anti-Semitism uh, today? I think it remains vitally important to any practice of anti-racism to understand it, even when Jews are not, crudely speaking, the most oppressed amongst all other minorities. And this is for three main reasons. First of all, looking at the Jewish case, forces us to ask questions about privilege and the limits of anti-racist sympathy. I'm not gonna say, as David Baddiel does, that Jews don't count on the left. I think that's far too crude. But it's certainly true that, as I said earlier, the fact that Jews have agency in the world is often treated as a reason, like, oh, at the, uh, in its most polite, oh, they're basically fine. We don't need to worry about them. And sometimes as being saying they're not they're not a minority at all. They're just assimilated into the white major, white major, white privileged majority. The second reason is that considering anti-Semitism forces us to ask questions that are relevant across a wide range of other racism and forms of hatred about the relationship between ideology and improvisation, about how off the cuff, so to speak, forms of abuse may become or not become part of a systematic worldview. And finally, I think an engagement with anti-Semitism forces us to place the subjects of anti-Semitism, of racism, at the center of the story. Because Jews don't shut up. People like me, we don't shut up, for good or for ill. And that confronts people with things they might not necessarily want to, want, want, want to confront. There's no real possibility when it comes to anti-Semitism about white saviourdom, right? Because Jews have too much experience and willingness to talk back. 
sometimes that's a problematic thing, but I think it does act as a check against the idea that we need to save the p poor oppressed peoples of the world and that their own voice doesn't really count very much. So I think that's why anti-Semitism is significant. Thank you so much, Keith. Our next speaker is, Ed, well, next speaker is Daniel Randall. Before he introduces himself, only thing I have to share, you can come over, it's okay. Uh, this event is not my idea alone, it was with him. So we plotted, so if I have to look for a, someone I was plotting, it was Daniel. So, and of course, uh, he's the one I have known for some time, including very, having very frank conversation, all kinds of prejudices, bigotries, etc., including Hindu nationalism, where he interviewed me, and of course, talking about anti-Semitism. So he's a comrade of mine. So I have to, you know, give my, disc well, be frank here. Thank you so much. So this is, will inevitably be anticlimactic after that introduction. Um, so as DBS mentioned, my name's Daniel Randall. Um, I'm a, a railway worker and a trade union activist. And I'm the author of the book, uh, Confronting Anti-Semitism on the Left, Arguments for Socialists, which Keith is helpfully holding up, which you can also buy copies of um, at the back. I'll get the plug out of the way in advance, so we don't need to repeat that. Um, I'll be referring to that occasionally throughout my talk. Um, I do want to thank Dibyesh for um, facilitating this and giving us the opportunity to, to, to have this discussion. Uh, inevitably, I think my own concern with and confrontation with anti-Semitism stems in part from my own Jewish identity and experience, um, including my own experiences of anti-Semitism. But I try and avoid writing and speaking about this topic uh, as a Jew, uh, quote unquote, in a way that implies my Jewishness confers a kind of additional validity um, on my ideas. And one reason for that is that I want to stress and emphasize a collective rather than what might be called particularist imperative in confronting anti-Semitism. Um, I think anti-Semitism does have a distinct potential to toxify and corrode political and social life. It's not only harmful to Jews. Um, so I think all of us, Jewish or not, um, have a direct interest in resisting it. And it, it's, it's also important, I think, that anti-Semitism isn't considered in, in abstraction as a kind of single issue. And Keith gestured towards some of this in his presentation. Um, the black American activist Eric K. Ward in um, a really powerful essay called Skin in the Game, which I urge you to read, describes anti-Semitism as the theoretical core of white nationalism. And contemporary far-right narratives about a so-called great replacement, which if you're not familiar with that, that's a sort of racist conspiracy theory about black and brown immigrants displacing white people in Europe and America, the great replacement conspiracy theories often have Jews, sometimes a single Jew, George Soros, at the heart of them as the kind of unseen figure um, pulling the strings. So I think it's important to identify these points of inter uh, intersection and, and, and contact with other bigotries and racisms. Um, my own confrontation with anti-Semitism is also shaped by my political background. I've been kind of educated politically in a, a heterodox uh, political tendency on the revolutionary socialist left called Workers' Liberty. We've had a critique of what we've called left anti-Semitism for, for many decades. And for a long period, that was a highly minoritarian and marginal view on the organized far left. Um, it's still a minority view, but, but I do say with some cautious optimism and for reasons we might discuss if we have time, that I think it's becoming less marginal. Um, and the, the kind of critique that I aim to make, which is a critique of anti-Semitism on the left, from the left. Um, that, that's a kind of growing body of, uh, of, of, of critique, I, I think, and hope. Um, although the title of the panel tonight refers to contemporary anti-Semitism, much of what I'm going to talk about will be historical in focus, and that's because I think understanding the historical roots of a phenomenon is essential, really, for identifying its contemporary manifestations. Um, my book examines in or, or attempts to sort of set out in more detail the contemporary echoes of the historical trends that I'm going to talk about. Um, mostly, most of, what, most of the rest of what I have to say is going to focus on anti-Semitism as it manifests on the radical left, and I just want to say a word about why I have that focus, and it's not because I think anti-Semitism on the left is the most dangerous form of anti-Semitism that we encounter today, 
certainly in terms of the threat of physical harm to Jews, Jewish spaces, other forms, especially far-right anti-Semitism, I think are undoubtedly the greater risk. Um, I focus on anti-Semitism on the left because I'm active on the left. I feel a particular responsibility to reckon with the ideological health of the movement and political traditions that I'm part of. Um, and I think the left will be inhibited from pursuing the emancipatory and egalitarian aims of our politics if we tolerate or sometimes even valorize, even in coded forms, uh, anti-democratic or bigoted ideas within our own perspective. So that was all kind of by way of introduction, and I guess this is the sort of main body of what I want to say. And I want to, I want to kick that off by saying a few words on what I understand anti-Semitism to be. And as some of the remarks Keith made will suggest, and as I'm sure you all know, this question, the question of definition of what anti-Semitism actually is, is significantly contested. To me, anti-Semitism is not reducible to uh, some simpler categorical label like Jew hate um, or dislike of Jews because they are Jewish, as I've sometimes heard it termed. And it's not even really reducible to anti-Jewish racism, which is a sort of tempting definition, but I think one that can obscure more than it clarifies. Um, I take my definition of modern anti-Semitism, and I think we do have to distinguish between different historical phases Although anti-Semitism has great antiquity as a form of bigotry, it's also historically contingent and um, varied. It's not a, a, a kind of force that transcends history. I think it's important to acknowledge that. So I take my definition of modern anti-Semitism from the, the late Marxist academic Moisha Postone, whose work I strongly recommend if you're interested in kind of theoretical exploration around these issues. Um, he did define anti-Semitism fundamentally as an ideology, an ideology and form of thought, which has what he called an anti-hegemonic, and pseudo-emancipatory character. And this ideological element, as Keith said, this offering of a narrative explanation for the way the world is organized is a characteristic that other forms of bigotry and racism don't necessarily have. So anti-Semitism claims to identify a socially manipulative power which is either explicitly named or coded as Jewish and purports to be an ideology of resistance to that power, offering its adherents a path to freedom, hence pseudo-emancipatory. And this creates, I would argue, a specific and distinct potential for anti-Semitism to manifest in specific and distinct forms on the left, which is, after all, a movement attempting to develop our own anti-hegemonic and, and genuinely, as opposed to pseudo-emancipatory narratives. Modern anti-Semitism, as it emerged in the 19th century, often had a kind of reactionary anti-capitalism um, or, or anti-financial capitalism at its core. It equated Jews with finance and saw capitalism as, in some sense, a specifically Jewish endeavor. And capitalism in that ideology is figured as a kind of incorporeal process, something that's conducted in the shadows by a hidden cabal. And by contrast, what I want to convince people of, as a Marxist, is that capitalism is something conducted primarily in the open. Uh, it's a social relation that the majority of us are directly engaged in every day by going to work and selling our labor power to a boss. And that's where our transformative power, our emancipatory power, if you like, lies not in a conspiracist quest to reveal an imagined hidden hand. And I think these ideas, although historic in origin, have been given significant new life since the 2008 crash and probably another turbo boost since the pandemic. Again, Keith alluded to that. And it's also in these rather murky waters that I think there's a risk of anti-Semitism on the left or the, the self-proclaimed left dovetailing with anti-Semitism on the right. One sometimes encounters uh, self-proclaimed leftists acting as apologists for leaders who head nationalist movements in which anti-Semitic critiques of finance are common. So Putin is a good example of that. And, and more rarely, uh, but still occasionally, you even find kind of would-be left apologetics for uh, Orban and sometimes, sometimes even Trump um, um, on the basis that they represent some kind of threat to or break from the kind of neoliberal uh, world order. And again, in my book, I refer to kind of specific examples of this, this kind of convergence. Um, so as well as these, uh, these narratives what we might call the kind of primitive narratives about finance and capitalism. I think anti-Semitism, as it manifests on the left, or has manifested on the left, has an additional and more recent set of roots uh, woven around perspectives towards Israel and Zionism, Jewish nationalism, which contend that this nationalism and the state it founded 
are almost kind of uniquely illegitimate um, and the sort of quintessential expression of colonialism and racism. There's sometimes an impulse in these discussions, uh, which if you've been around this sort of discourse before, I'm sure you'll have encountered and maybe even felt, to attempt to decouple discussion of anti-Semitism from discussion of the politics of Israel-Palestine. And I think that impulse is very understandable, but ultimately not operable, not viable. Um, anti-Semitism on the left and often more broadly is so bound up with ways of framing Israel-Palestine that the issues I think have to be considered in parallel. So to make my own perspective clear, I think it's important to do that um, on the politics of the matter. I believe that opposition to Israel's oppression of the Palestinians, which I see as essentially colonial in character, is a duty for anyone who believes in democratic principles such as self-determination. And I think that's particularly important in the context of recent political developments in Israel. And I also think it's important if we're thinking about whether and how criticism of Israel can be anti-Semitic, that a diversity of Palestinian voices are part of that conversation. And in fact, uh, one can find what I consider very important critiques of anti-Semitism that emerge from Palestinian national politics and discourse um, from figures such as Edward Said and others, some of which I refer to in my book. Um, historically, this strand of left anti-Semitism focused on Israel-Palestine, I think, has its key origins in Stalinism by which I mean not only the period of Joseph Stalin's personal rule in the USSR, but the ideological edifice emerging out of that, uh, which still persists today, albeit in a degraded form. And I think you can see evidence of that persistence around the way some sections of the left have responded to Russia's war in Ukraine, and that's something we might discuss as well. So to give some historical background on this, from the 1950s onwards, industrial scale campaigns were launched in the Stalinist states in which Jewish dissidents, both real and imagined, were accused of conspiring to destabilize society. And in these campaigns, something that was named as Zionism held roughly the same position that the figure of the Jewish financier had occupied in the previous kind of primitive um, conspiracy theorist strand, i.e. a global socially manipulative force impelling all social ills. Stalinist anti-Zionism inflated Israel to the status of a world-shaping power and, and reified, that is, you know, gives something that's abstract, the character of something concrete, it reifies Zionism into a monolithic and singular agency engaged in a drive for world domination. Um, and Linked to this is a, is a wider perspective that splits the world into discrete imperialist and anti-imperialist camps or blocks. And in that splitting, this form of anti-Zionism designates not only the Israeli state or its polity, but really the entire Israeli Jewish national people as irredeemably reactionary and undeserving of any collective rights. And it, it kind of extending from that, there's also an explicit, desig uh, an implicit rather, designation as reactionary, or at least a holding in suspicious contempt of the majority of Jews worldwide, who I think for understandable and not easily detachable reasons, have some affinity with the idea of a Jewish state and see Israel as emerging from experiences of anti-Semitism and centrally the Holocaust. Um, this form of anti-Zionism, and it is only one form, uh, this form of anti-Zionism, which came to shape sections of the way the far left thought and think about Israel-Palestine, is, I would argue, antithetical to the democratic internationalism and solidarity that a genuinely emancipatory politics requires as its foundation. So uh, I'll conclude by saying a few words about how I think we can counter the contemporary manifestations of the trends I've talked about. Um, I see the confrontation with anti-Semitism on the left as fundamentally a matter of political debate and education. Confrontation with anti-Semitism on the far right might have what we might call a more physical character. It might involve direct action, it might involve physical defense of community spaces, it might involve conf confrontation with far right mobilization. Confronting anti-Semitism on the left I think doesn't have that character and is fundamentally a matter of um, education and debate. Um, responses have often been posed in essentially administrative terms, particularly in the discussion around this in the Labour Party. Basically, how can we streamline complaints and disciplinary procedures to make it easier to kick people out of the Labour Party or other spaces? And I think this approach is really a dead end. Um, we need instead a political educational campaign to confront and overcome these ideas. That work is difficult and uh, 
it will inevitably involve some messy and unpleasant discourse, but I think there's no shortcut around it, and it can't really be flinched from. Um, practically, I think that can involve a number of forms, and I think panels like the one we're having tonight are one of those forms. Um, I don't imagine anyone came into this meeting tonight a sort of convinced left anti-Semite. Of, of course, no one thinks of themselves in those terms anyway, um, and, and is leaving having had their minds totally changed. But I do think discussions like the one we're having tonight can help us clarify our thinking about these issues um, and leave us better equipped to go into spaces where we're active, whether that's on the left, the wider labor movement, the student movement, or elsewhere, to identify and confront anti-Semitism wherever we encounter it, not as a single issue, not in abstraction, but as part of a wider effort to pursue a politics that aims to expand and deepen freedom, equality, and solidarity. I'll leave it there, thanks. Okay, doesn't matter. We, well, well, this, uh, I think you have to log in again. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Daniel. And our third and, not final, but third speaker, Daniel. Hello. I don't have a book to plug, so you'll just have to listen to me. Um, so I'm Danielle Bett. I am Scottish-Israeli, if you're trying to figure out my accent. I currently am based in Tel Aviv, and I work for Yachad, which is a British-Jewish anti-occupation organization. Um, and I've worked with the British-Jewish community for the past five-plus years. Um, so that's where a lot of my perspectives on anti-Semitism in the UK come from. I'm actually going to tackle the fun issue of Israel and anti-Semitism, because I think often we talk around that, as Daniel mentioned, but we're often not very comfortable with diving into Israel and anti-Semitism and how we better speak and criticize Israel without being anti-Semitic um, and kind of the red flags to avoid and why the Jewish community is often so sensitive about this issue. Um, so I think the first thing we need to understand, and when I first moved to the UK when I was around 15, is the Jewish community's relationship to Israel. I found that really difficult to understand even as an Israeli. Um, first of all, maybe the most obvious point is that the vast majority of Jews in the diaspora feel that Israel forms part of their identity. They feel connected to Israel in some way, shape, or form. And I think as non-Jews, people must accept that. Um, it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that our community has Israel in its education, from schools to youth movements to um, student campuses. Israel is very much a part of our identity in, in family life and as individuals, but also in Jewish kind of systems and um, spaces. And I think that's a really, really key thing that a lot of people who are not Jewish might not understand. Jews in the UK often learn Hebrew. They are often um, taken on free trips to Israel. So Israel is part of our narrative as Jews, and those two things cannot be Jewish identity and Israel and Israeliness cannot be separated. Um, I think part of the issue that Keith mentioned too is that we often perceive the Jewish community and Jewish people as victorious, which is why they're often excluded in anti-racist spaces and conversations. We see Jews in a post-Holocaust sense. We feel that after the, Hol the Holocaust was awful and it's important to talk about the Holocaust, but now that's in the past and we don't really need to worry about anti-Semitism because it's a historical issue. And I think it's really important to realize that first of all, the Holocaust wasn't that long ago and most Jews who have come are descendants of people who survived the Holocaust, that has had a really serious impact on their lives and upbringing and that trauma carries through generationally. But also that the Holocaust is not the only instance of Jewish persecution or Jewish exile and in the context of anti-Semitism in Israel, that's really important to understand because actually over 50% of Jews in Israel do not come from European backgrounds, but rather from Middle Eastern backgrounds or indeed other backgrounds. And so many Jews who live in modern day Israel come from what well, we, Mizrahi backgrounds as in Middle Eastern backgrounds. My family comes from Yemen originally, although they moved before the creation of the state of Israel. We have Ethiopian Jews, um, Jews from, the, from Eastern Europe. And so, Persecution, exile, and um, racism and anti-Semitism are not linked solely to the Holocaust and not an issue of the past for us. They're very much alive and well today, and that is why Israel is so central to Jewish identity and seen as such a safe haven for Jews still in the Jewish communal context. It's not seen as something that once was needed and is now no longer a necessity. 
Um, I also think that we have to keep in mind that this idea of a refuge and denying this need of a refuge is, is denying anti-Semitism, except for the Holocaust. And I think too often in non-Jewish audiences, again, where people are comfortable with talking about the Holocaust, but not any other form of anti-Semitism, because they're talking about historical anti-Semitism, which we're more comfortable with confronting than than other forms of modern anti-Semitism, modern persecution. Why have Jews left Ethiopia? Why have Jews left Morocco? Why have Jews left Iraq? Those are questions that we really need to ask and understand if we want to tackle the question of Israel and why Jews feel that Israel is necessary for them as a homeland. Um, I'm also very conscious as someone who works for an anti-occupation organization that Jews are often quick to defend Israel and everything that it does. Um, I think that we as a community need to be honest about that and we are having those conversations. We need to be better at those conversations. Um, but I think that is also that link, that Jewish link to Israel and Israeliness is so embedded in our community and our culture that when we feel that someone who is unfamiliar with Israeli narratives and Jewish narratives is attacking Israel, we feel like our identity is actually being attacked. And Sometimes that's true, and we need to be honest about that too, but it's often, it's often not true. And I would say most criticism of Israel is valid and is not an attack on Jewish people or Jewishness. Um, but those two identities of Israel and Judaism or Jewishness are intrinsically linked and inseparable, and I think it's very important that everyone comes to term and accepts that as a starting point. Um, and that's why we see that Jewish communal organizations often defend political actions of Israel's where, in my view, they shouldn't, why they enter discussions on, with the UN on international law, which is absolutely not the place of a British uh, Jewish communal organization to, to enter. But that's why we see that, is because Israel and Jewishness are intrinsically two linked identities. Um, at the same time, we do have kind of pro-Israel organizations which are, have entered diaspora spaces. And so it's not just even Jewish organizations anymore that we have. We have non-Jewish pro-Israel organizations, sometimes also Christian organizations, which use the Jewish link to Israel to enter the conversation on Jewishness and Israel as well. And so my view is that our community must reduce us expectations on how non-Jews understand Israel and Israeliness and Jewishness, but also non-Jews need to accept that they need to do better and try and understand where we have we are having those conversations and where our identity lies, and to accept that if Jewish people call out a red flag when it comes to Israel, we might know better than non-Jews on um, why we are raising those concerns and raising those red flags. And I think that's where the crux of the Labour Party, and I'm not going to get into the Labour stuff too much, uh, the Labour Party battle ha came into is non-Jews feeling often that they were not being heard when they were calling out red flags on a lot of the anti-Semitic issues. Um, so the big question is really where does the li line sit between where anti-Semitism is and where criticism, is, criticism of Israel is valid. Um, again, I think it's legitimate to criticize Israel. I criticize Israel on a daily basis. Um, I work for an organization that focuses on criticizing Israel within the Jewish community and also in parliament. I think it's important to, to, to support Israelis who fight against occupation, especially right now who are fighting for democracy, um, supporting a non-existent peace process, um, and again, working people who are trying to insert more nuance into our Jewish communal discussion. And as a community, I, I do think we need to get to a point, as a Jewish community, that we need to get to a point where we understand the criticism of Israel, even when it's harsh, even when we dislike it, even if, when it makes us terribly uncomfortable, criticism of Israel is usually not inherently anti-Jewish. Israel is maintaining a violent military occupation against Palestinians that is getting worse, not better. Israel is powerful, and it is a powerful player out of the two players in this conflict. And Israel's politicians have perfected populist tactics and increased racism in Israel and dragged us to a place where the Israeli government is the most far-right government in Israel's history. Nothing I have said so far has been anti-Semitic, and criticism of Israel isn't just valid, it's needed. I, I really do, you see right now Israelis in the street pleading for international support. Um, this is not because they hate the state of Israel. Many of those people are absolutely not left-wing people. Um, many of them don't talk about occupation. They are pleading for international criticism, and even some are pleading for sanctions and boycotts against Israel because they believe in democracy. Um, 
And so again, I think much of the diaspora and the Jewish diaspora needs to become more comfortable, and I often plead with the Jewish diaspora to help Israelis currently fighting for democracy, fighting against occupation, uh, fighting for the kind of dying hope of a two-state solution. However, the lines uh, are sometimes, if not often, crossed in the debate on Israel and Palestine. Um, I think it's crucial that uh, non-Jews and people who pride themselves on being anti-racist understand what that looks like to Jewish people and accept that we are able to identify those red flags where others might not. We're able to identify when our community and our identity is being uh, attacked. So for example, a Palestinian flag is not anti-Semitic. A Palestinian flag being stuck on a synagogue could be an anti-Semitic incident because you are targeting Jews. Right? Um, using the word Zionists and talking about Zionism rather than talking about Jews. Often now people won't know that they're not allowed to say Jews when they criticize uh, our community. So they say Zionists, but what they really mean is Jews. So it's just a new language. These are new, new forms of anti-Semitism, but the context is the same and, and the, the warning signs are the same. Um, as I mentioned, I think you really need to understand Israel in a Jewish context, not only in a Jewish context, because I think it's important to understand the Palestinian narrative, but it's important to understand Israel in a Jewish context in order to have a more nuanced view on this discussion and to understand the, the toxic impact that this conversation has been having on Jewish communities. Um, and, and often that comes down to discussions on delegitimizing Israel's entire right to exist. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't question Israel's borders, that doesn't mean you can't question its government or its military, or even question the founding of the State of Israel. But completely delegitimizing the idea that Jews need a nation state as opposed to any other um, group, and not accepting the Jewish discourse around that, and like I said, maybe only accepting that Jews once were refugees from the Holocaust and, and no other persecution against Jews has ever existed, I think that delegitimization is blatantly problematic because you're not only erasing the existing crisis of anti-Semitism and the many years of refuge and persecution, you're denying it entirely. And if you deny Jewish history, if you deny anti-Semitism, you're perpetuating anti-Semitism. Um, I mean, even in the most recent Russian-Ukraine conflict, we've seen Ukrainian Jewish refugees uh, come to Israel. Um, and we, again, we can have serious debates about whether or not that's the fair and right way of doing things and whatever else, but, but you can't deny the need for Jewish refuge. Um, secondly, there's also just the very old school, what I would refer to as old school anti-Semitism, which in conversations in Israel often crosses the line. Um, Anti-Semitic tropes, which mainly you would notice around conspiracy theories. So. The idea that Israel is all-powerful, the idea that Israel is controlling the world, that Israeli politicians are controlling the world, links to bankers, um, ideas of controlling the media, um, and I th the kind of world strings pooling that Israel and Jews or Zionists supposedly are doing. And I think really when you look at those tropes of media control and bankers and pulling strings, if you throw the word Rothschilds into that, you have the perfect... Uh, storm of what is old school anti-Semitism, but rather than putting it on Jewish people, you're putting it on the Jewish state. Um, and again, those are red flags that Jewish people are, and Jewish communities have become very good at recognizing, and so that's why I always say is, if we are calling out anti-Semitism, it doesn't mean that we're always right, but you should be taking us seriously. Um, and the last kind of main concept that I wanted to address around Israel, um, which I think is one of the key issues and why Israel is misunderstood and why criticism of Israel is, even when it's deserved, is often misplaced, um, is because Israel is conceptualized as a white colonial state. Um, so I'll add my disclaimer, uh, which is that I'm very conscious of the impact of Israel's existence on Palestinians. And the creation of Israel created the Nakba for Palestinians, and I do not deny that narrative or the hurt that was caused for Palestinians, nor do I want to downplay that. I'm obviously not Palestinian, so it's absolutely not my right to tell the Palestinian story. Um, 
but I'm focusing not on the discussion that is happening in Israel and Palestine, but rather on the discussion that's happening in Europe um, and elsewhere abroad. Often people who critically speak of Israel abroad, they define Israel as white European, as I've already said. That's simply not true because most Israelis are not of white European descent. They're either of mixed races or of um, Middle Eastern descent. Israel's Europeans also were largely refugees from the Holocaust. And we need to be very, very honest about that. They are the ones that survived. The, the white Europeans were, were not white colonizer in the classic sense that a lot of, especially in left-wing circles, like to speak about. We can't simply um, water down Holocaust survivors and refugees that came to Israel as villains. We just can't do that. We can be critical of Zionism. We can be critical of Israel's current settler enterprise. We should be criticize, criticizing Jewish supremacy and Israeli government, especially at the moment, 100% absolutely. But to make Jews of European descent as white colonizers and to sell that narrative is mischaracterizing history and it's erasing Jewish um, persecution and anti-Semitism, as well as uh, watering down the Holocaust. Um, Second, as I said, most Israelis would not pass as white in Europe. They are mostly of Mizrahi or mixed race backgrounds. Um, I don't like to paint Israel as this wonderful, diverse land where everyone is um, European, uh, Middle Eastern, and because I think that's also something that's mis-selling Israel. Um, but but most Israeli Jews are not white passing. They are Jews of Middle Eastern descent or of uh, kind of mixed backgrounds, and that that's really really important to to not take that um, and to paint or whitewash Israelis. Um, like I said, people who kind of sell pro-Israel narratives, people who deal with Hasbara, if you're familiar with that term, will often use Israel's diverse ethnicities to paint it as kind of, it can't be racist because look, we're all of different, uh, different heritages. That's also obviously incorrect. It's an unfair um, overplaying Israel's diversity. Um, but Israel, and Israel has a racist government that's trying to enact racist policies. We have a huge racism problem in Israeli society. In Israel against Palestinians, racism is absolutely an issue in Israel, but to paint Israel as white European is reductive, it's incorrect, and in my view, it's also racist. In the UK, and this is a very specific form and kind of smaller potentially form of anti-Semitism, in the UK, most Israeli immigrants aren't white passing. Many of them face immigration challenges, just like any immigrants from many other countries. They have to tackle the home office and the UK immigration system. They face language barriers, socioeconomic barriers of being new immigrants into the UK. So I think that's another part of an element of anti-Semitism that we see today is that specifically racism against Israelis, which is rooted in misunderstanding Israel as white, misunderstanding Israelis as inherently always privileged, is a huge issue. Um, so they not, don't only face the, anti, the classic anti-Semitism of um, conspiracies and so on, they face act, the, uh, racism against their accent, they're not white passing, they face systemic issues, as well as casual racism against anyone else who appears as non-British or non-white. Um, so I think that uh, my kind of final concluding, so to paint Israelis and Jews uh, as all powerful as white to erase our history makes it easier to reduce the Jewish struggle, to downplay anti-Semitism and to allow anti-Semitism to flourish. And none of these considerations prevent you from advocating for Palestinians, from advocating against occupation or for a two-state solution if, if you so wish. But you have to take into account the Jewish narrative, even if you don't entirely endorse it, you have to take into account the Jewish narrative when you speak about Israel. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, all three of you have covered range of subject. By the way, we didn't agree in advance what who's going to say what. We had some idea, but not fully. But thank you so much because you have ranged from history to politics to including very tricky issues. And a lot of time I've noticed, especially when there's a discussion anti-Semitism, there's almost a silence on Israel and Palestine because it seems most people don't know how to deal with that. So thank you so much, Daniel, for doing that. I have a question for each one of you, and then maybe you could answer briefly, and then we'll open up to the audience. Uh, for Keith, I mean, you, know, you talked about, I have so many questions, but I'll focus only one. You talk of Jews on both sides thing, right? And the whole good Jew, bad Jew. Because we have come, actually, I have come across a lot of that kind of discussion where a lot would use the word anti-Zionist when they are actually being anti-Semitic. They'll start by saying, oh, but the person saying this with whom I am agreeing is 
Jewish themselves. So there's a lot of focus by non-Jews on those Jewish figures who criticize Israel, which is fine, they should criticize Israel, but that's so how, how do we deal with this, the intra-Jewish struggle over these things and link it with how some of that is used, misused and abused by very blatantly anti-Semitic people who are not Jewish themselves, because that validates the point. I hope I'm, you get what I'm saying, right? So that's one. We can wait. And then, do you want to respond? And then, okay, fine. Go ahead, respond. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I think one of the reasons why it's worth thinking about anti-Semitism as it is today is that it is forcing um, some very uncomfortable issues in anti-racist practice that were never fully addressed uh, about who it is you're actually defending and what are the ultimate telos of anti-racism actually is. I say something quite provocative in the book, which is if you're celebrating diversity, you're doing it wrong. The fact is a diverse society is also a politically diverse society. And ethno-religious, ethnic religious minorities do have their politics and they often see their politics as foundational to their identity and they often don't agree amongst themselves about it. And one of the things that's happened in the last 20 years with this explosion of the public sphere is that it's exploded the conflicts within communities themselves. And that's a huge opportunity for uh, 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 for racism to worm in through the back door by picking and choosing those within minorities or between or from one minority over another. But I don't think it's just Jews. I think the process is much more advanced with Jews, but we are on a bit of a precipice at the moment with regard to hin in, in Britain with Hindus from the Indian subcontinent because it's been quite, with, with the presence in government of people like uh, Priti Patel or Suela Brahman, she's not Hindu, so actually she's uh, Buddhist, I think, but, um, and, and the presence of, uh, of course, Rishi Sunak himself. You know, I just forgot that Rishi Sunak was the prime minister. I actually forgot he, that we have a prime minister. Um, weird. Um, <laughs> um, you can certainly see in some quarters of the left some an emerging selectivity that is already well advanced with regard to Jews, like that people like Priti Patel have removed their right from uh, anti-racist protection. They have essentially become white privilege, even though their skin is not white. Um, again, it's not as far as advanced with, with Jew, as with Jews, but it is certainly, it's certainly getting there. I think that part of the argument I make in my book is that anti-racist solidarity is about de defending people you despise, if it's to mean anything at all. It's really easy to defend people you like, you know, like, oh, and, and to think of, like, for, for example, the good Jews who fought at the Battle of the Fascists at the Battle of Cable Street in left wing mythology, or if you're on the right, the good Jews who are the sort of turbo capitalists, uh, you know, neoliberal avant la lettre, if you like. It's not easy to defend people that you would rather, forms of Jewish tradition that you would rather not exist. But there's a there's, there is a, 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 there is at least a reward at the end of this process of what I call in my book sullen solidarity, which is on a purely instrumental level, if you want Jews to stop being Zionist, then you have to let them be Zionists because it's only if people are told that they can, that their, ident that their choice of identity is theirs to make that people might actually start to question them. And it's that that's and it's the same with with with, with him. If you want it, 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 uh, those Hindus who support Hindu Hindu Vata, I can't remember how you pronounce Hindu nationalism. Hindu, 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 Hindu nationalism, then you have to give them the right to be Hindu nationalists and to uh, 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 even if you find their politics vile. 
Okay, well, I'm not sure. My whole work is that we should create no space to fascists, but that's fine. And I'm talking Hindutva as fascist because Hindutva is fascist. That's my view, my work. Anyway, let's move on to Daniel there. Now, you did talk of ideology. You made a very important point. I wish you could expand a bit when you talk about anti Semitism, it's more ideology kind of thing. Because when you talk of ideology, then I'm not saying they're, let's say, authors or founders of ideology, but generally they would be people who have created that kind of ideology then promote it, there will be parties or there will be organizations that promote it and therefore there is a particular project of that ideology to do something, right? Take over a state, control a state. Now how is anti-Semitism, I understand in historical context, but in today's context, what does that anti-Semitism and ideology do which anti-Semitism as racism doesn't do for you? Given that much of anti-Semitism is not only about imagination of Jews as something, but it's a very visceral, embodied imagination of Jews? Hmm. Obviously, it's the case that um, all racism is on some level ideological. Um, in some senses, you could say it's a purely ideological, you know, it's not something that, it, it's, a, it's a fiction, right? It doesn't have a material, a real material basis in, uh, you know, you, you could argue it's a, it, it's a wholly ideological phenomenon. I guess what I'm talking about when I draw this distinction between um, anti-Semitism as ideology is a kind of ideological narrative and worldview um, that the forms of anti-Semitism I've been critiquing have at their core um, not just a kind of dualistic binary which is you know non-Jews are good and Jews are bad you might say that's a that's a very kind of crude dualistic binary which is not very sophisticated ideologically in fact um, anti-Semitism often posits th 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 this idea that um, it's an explanation for the whole way the world is organized. It's not just a way of thinking about Jews in relation to non-Jews, it's an explanation for how the world is the way it is and where do social ills come from and where does exploitation come from, where does oppression come from, where does colonialism come from, where, you know, it's wh whatever it might be. Um, uh, it, it has this uh, ideological, this would-be explanatory character um, and crucially it's, it's uh, I refer again to Postone's term, anti-hegemonic and pseudo-emancipatory, which slightly jargonistic words, but what they mean is that it, this narrative sets itself up as being a narrative of resistance to power that offers its adherents a path to freedom from this power that it's identified. And you can find traces of that in other forms of bigotry, um, but it's not necessarily typical of them. It's it's relatively. I, I I would never. I would. I wouldn't say unique, but it is. Just, I think quite distinct and particular in the case of um, anti-Semitism, and that for me is one of the things which makes it a generally dangerous because, g given this sophisticated ideological character, it has a potential to corrode and toxify political and social life generally, and specifically dangerous for the left, um, given this anti-hegemonic and pseudo-emancipatory character. Thank you. And for Daniel, again, I had more in agreement with you than anything else I was getting. Yes, you're saying things that people should be thinking of, particularly on Israel-Palestine, that, of course, critique of Israel, Israeli occupation does not necessarily mean anti-Semitic, but there can be critiques of Israeli occupation that is very anti-Semitic, and that's important. And one thing which you have to bear in mind, of course, is let's say you are opposing occupation, but if there's an obsession with Israeli occupation of Palestine, and I found that a lot in the UK context there, uh, it's okay, I understand that people are focused on Palestinian suffering and Israel, but there's almost an obsession with it, which for me is nothing but anti-Semitic because when they talk of China with the Uyghurs or Tibetans, or when they talk of India with the Kashmiris or Turkey with the Kurds, they don't have any sympathy there, but it's almost always only about Palestinian. So for me, I mean, and this for all of us to think is, why would, if you're Palestinian, that's different. But for, let's say, someone who's not being occupied directly, why that singular focus on one cause? And my own reading with a lot of them is, it is driven by the idea that Israel is essentially white. Israel is essentially white. And we are somehow leading that kind of anti-colonial things. But it's not generally anti-colonial, because if you were, then you'd also critique India, China, Turkey, and other places, right? Now, the question for you is, in terms of how do you, I mean, in your, how do you, let's say, engage with, challenge, or try to convince those Jews who see any criticism of Israel as anti-Semitic, 
and not only those who see, but they also do it on social media. They deliberately do it. So they would actually weaponize anti-Semitism to justify everything that Israel does, and also confront those who are not, who are criticizing Israel, but they see any criticism of Israel as valid because Israel is an occupying state. So how, what kind of methods do you suggest people should use to challenge both? Um, you've half answered my question in your first statement, so because I completely agree. Um, so first of all, I think we have to come out of. It's not the role of non-Jews to educate Jews on how to behave around Israel. I think it's really, really important that this discussion centers around the Jewish community itself and that we empower voices in the Jewish community, but that we avoid empowering the 0.25% of Jews that we really like what they have to say. Because I think that's a tendency that people have, that they go to the, to the couple of Jews that they know that are super anti-occupation and um, anti-Zionist and don't believe Israel has the right to exist. And we agree with them on the left, not me, but people who agree with them are like, oh, see, I've got two Jews that I agree with. And I think we need to avoid just giving a platform to those Jews who are not representative, even of the, the left wing side of the Jews. Um, I think how we tackle it is, is to empower the voices in the left, and I won't plug a book, but I'll plug my organization, organizations like Yahad, who add nuance into the discussion in the community, who platform a more nuanced, difficult conversation on Israel-Palestine, um, but also platforming Israeli human rights organizations who talk about these issues. There are thousands of Israelis who are involved in anti-occupation and anti-racism work in Israel, and they deserve a platform, and they need a platform internationally. And so actually adding to the discussion by platforming really valid voices, and there are a lot of valid voices that talk about human rights in the region, um, but also by acknowledging the fact that there is anti-Semitism within this discussion, just as there is anti-Palestinian racism in the discussion of those who choose to solely defend Israel and to ignore the occupation and to ignore the nuance in this discussion. Um, and so I think the best way to be an ally and to, to be productive in the discussion is to be an ally to voices which are valid but aren't fringe. And, and to, to give the other side of it is that there are also, um, there will be a handful of Palestinian voices which support the Israeli government and will tell you that there is no racism in Israel. Um, and you, you will see people, and I, I won't name the individuals, but you will see people platforming Palestinians who, who are, the, the again, 0.25% of Palestinians that, that don't talk about occupation. And that's an unfair thing to do because then it's very easy for people on the other side to, 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 to dismiss those voices. Um, and so I think we have to be honest about who we're platforming, honest about who we're speaking with, and honest about who we're listening to as well, um, and supporting as much as possible organizations and people who are doing the work in, in communities um, to try and make the discussion more nuanced. Thank you so much. Now we open it to questions. So how could you raise your hand so that we know how many questions and you can let, whether it's addressed to one person, two people, or, or the entire panel. So we'll start with you. Microphone there, and then here you. Yes. Both questions together and respond? Yes. Yeah, thank, okay, thank, few. Thank okay. Yeah, thank you. I think I introduce myself to you. I'd like to introduce you to the floor. Uh, my name is Joshua Heinrich. I'm the current vice president of the Jewish Society at the University of Westminster. And as that, I, have the, I had the honor to be at the conference of the Jewish Union of Jewish Students. And um, I can say that uh, we don't, even though we advocate with one voice, we, we have multiple voices within the Jewish community, as can be seen at every conference, even on the issue of Israel. And with that, Danielle, I'd like to have a question which I had for us to ask from one of the uh, conference attendees. Um, do, you th do you think that it is possible that Israel can be democratic and Jewish at the same time. Uh, Miriam, uh, we can pass it on there. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Miriam Dweck. Um, I wanted really to direct the question about this colonialism and Zionism um, issue because I think in the university spaces, particularly, if you, if I were to go and tell some of my colleagues that I'm a Zionist, even though I consider myself a progressive Zionist they would immediately be absolutely appalled. They would think that I was some sort of racist um, because the term Zionism has been now sort of associated with a lot of, in, in, the, in the minds of 
colleagues uh, with a lot of very negative connotations. So I suppose the question to me is, how do we, as progressive Jews, who you know recognize the conflict that's going on with the Palestinians and so on, how do we get our voice out there without being no platformed ultimately? So that's my question. Thank you. Anyone else? No? OK, one more, and then we'll come back here. Um, yeah, I think my question's probably to everyone, but I was kind of thinking, well, Daniel, because uh, your experience of like, politics like in, in the left, um, I came here because I feel really disconnected from the whole issue of like anti-Semitism. I don't really... I remember when the whole kind of thing around Corbyn and the party back then, the discussion around uh, anti-Semitic uh, like, comments being made, I was really surprised. I didn't really think it was a, a thing, you know? I feel, so I, I, I don't really understand it too much. Um, so I guess my question is, like, where do you think it's... Where do you think it's kind of produced and reproduced? Um, and how kind of, like, prevalent do you think it is in kind of left-wing politics in the UK today? Thank you. We have three questions. So who'd like to start? I mean... Daniel, maybe? OK. Yeah. Um, so on the cat Israel be democratic and Jewish, in one word, theoretically, yes. Uh, currently, in principle, it's clearly struggling. Um, yes, so Israel can be Jewish in character and democratic. That doesn't mean um, in the same, same way that cr countries can be Christian in character, but still democratic. I think that the, obviously the biggest challenge is how do you maintain a Jewish major majority in the state? Because let's be realistic, it's going to be down to if it's a Jewish majority state. Um, but I, I, that's the biggest question that comes up. I don't believe that to be the biggest challenge. I think that first of all, it depends on how you characterize Jewish. And does that mean that we are a religious author a authocracy? Or does that mean that we are Jewish characteristically and that we allow for religious freedom, that we allow for secular freedom? Um, so again, if, if that is the case and, and, uh, and there is freedom of faith and belief. Second of all, Israel doesn't have an equality law. So that also is a step that Israel has to take that makes all of its citizens equal. Um, and also we are trying to currently, um, there is a law against discrimination, which we're trying to backtrack on in, in, in Israel, thanks to the new government. So anti-discrimination laws also have to be in place. Um, and lastly, Israel can be Jewish and democratic if it has a Palestinian state at its side, and if it is not controlling um, Palestinian people under uh, military occupation. And so, and that also resolves to me part of the demographic issue, which is the question of Palestinians in Israel, which people are afraid, personally, is not a concern for me. Um, but the minute there are two states and two theoretically equal partners at the table, um, which allow for one state which is Jewish in character and one state which is Palestinian in character and that's up to Palestinians to define how that state looks, then yes, theoretically I believe we can have a state which is both Jewish and democratic. So I'd, I'd like to address uh, Miriam's question. I think the whole issue about how Zionism relates to colonial I I imperialism, there's a lot of work to be done on multiple different sides. I think the first thing to say is this debate often suffers, it's the same as the use of the word apartheid. Historical comparisons are normal part of debate and are necessary and that's you know, how we understand the world. But the, 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 the reproduction in its entirety of one template from one place to another place, that's not really how comparison works. Right? And it also very rarely happens in the real world. So, you know, how, for example, how uh, the French ruled um, somewhere like Senegal and how the British ruled Nigeria was not the same, right? They were both forms of imperialism, but they were different characteristics and you, and you have to understand the differences between them and the legacies that they give. So that's the first point. The second thing is I think Jewish Zionist Jews relationship to colonialism is often a bit weird and contradictory. Um, the the um, 
the headquarters of a number of Jewish organizations in Finchley, in, in, in London, uh, including the uh, United Jewish Israel Appeal, was Balfour House. And in fact, Balfour is taught a lot. And you go to many uh, Israeli cities and there will be, in, in, in Tel Aviv, there's Rehov Alambi, right? So there is this weird uh, sense that some legitimacy comes from that British colonialism, at the same time disavowing it and also talking about struggling against the British during the mandate period. So it's, it's very weird and contradictory. And I think that actually Jews need to rec uh, recognize the uh, at least the colonial, uh, the imperialist world within which Israel came to be, at the, uh, at the very least. Because Israel cannot be, uh, even though there are things, I think, in the Israeli case that are incredibly different from other settler colonial societies, no, uh, uh, the most major one being when the British uh, colonized Australia, there weren't a pre-existing group of British people who were already there. Whereas there have been, there's a continuous Jewish presence in the land of Israel that, that sometimes it was quite small numbers, often very small numbers. And there was also immigration to, to Israel for centuries, you know, including in like the 16th century to, to places like Sfat. Again, not large numbers of people. That isn't part of the template, but other bits are. Other bits absolutely are. And I think Jews need to acknowledge those bits at the very least. But I think there's also, for, for people who consider themselves anti-imperialists, I think there's also a bit of contradiction there as well, because when Israel is, is treated as a settler colonial state, it's not actually being treated as other settler colonial states, even on its own terms. First of all, it's often treated as the prototypical form of form that imperialism takes in the world, both today and yesterday. And therefore, it is given a primacy and a sense that if we can reverse Zionism in some way, we, th there is a sort of cascade effect that this has a foundational thing about it, which is something that could often lead to anti-Semitism, I certainly think. Uh, but it's also, I'm sure Danny would say this, it's also really infantile politics. The idea, there, there are multiple countries where you could produce a just solution tomorrow and nothing very much else outside of that region is actually going to change. Um, but also I think that, that Israel is often not treated the way America's treated, the way Australia's treated, the way that South Africa is treated. Um, uh, it particularly in terms, I mean, there is a de facto, the, the, well, I think there is a place for some kinds of boycotts, but the idea of absolute severing any kind of connection with Israel, which you sometimes get, is quite contradictory to how people will relate to America, right? There are people, anti-imperialist scholars, who will turn down a invitation in Israel, but not turn down a, 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 an invitation in, uh, in Australia or, or America or somewhere like that. So I think there's a lot of muddled uh, thinking on all sides here. And I think that part of that is also the, the level of, certainly in this country, the level of, uh, of education about empire is shockingly poor. You know, I did, I'll start in a second. So for example, I did for A-level, I did 16th and 17th century British history. We never talked about Ireland. We never talked about America. We never talked about the beginnings of empire at all. Nothing, not a bit, throughout my entire time at school. It's probably a bit better now, but not much. Thanks. Um, well, I'll speak mainly to the question that I think was m more primarily directed to me, and then if there's time, I might respond to some of the other issues that have come up in the discussion. I think one of the first things to grasp about the sort of anti-Semitism crises or scandals as they emerged in and around the Labour Party is that they were often presented as a sort of, this, this stuff has just uh, sprung out of nowhere under uh, Corbyn's leadership, um, often making him the sort of sort of totemically responsible for it all. That is entirely inaccurate. These are trends that have long histories on the left. I mean, you, you can actually, you could, you could track back something that I think it would be reasonable to call left anti-Semitism pretty much back to the inception of socialism as a distinct form of politics so named. Um, on the early 19th century left, there are lots of figures 
who saw anti-Semitism as being a perfectly compatible part of their progressive worldview. Uh, Fourier, Saint-Simon, Proudhon, Bakunin, Stirner, Bauer to some degree, you know, a whole, whole gamut. So this idea of a kind of uh, anti-Semitism manifesting on the left, firstly not new, and I think what happened under, uh, with a lot of the scandals and furories under Corbynism is you know, people talk about uh, the, the, the right weaponized anti-Semitism to attack Corbyn. It's like, well, that's true to a degree. That is part of what was happening. But they were seizing on something that existed, that was real, that was there, and, and sort of punching a bruise. And I think it's not really good enough to just say, well, that's unfair for them to call this out. Yeah, they, the right and the media may have been doing that for reasons connected to their own political agenda and perhaps cynically and perhaps hypocritically, but um, something has to exist in order for it to be weaponized. Um, so I think that's, that's the, the, the first thing to say. You also asked, I think, a useful and important question about how this stuff is reproduced. There's no simple answer to that. I think uh, over the past 10 years, you know, Keith talked about the explosion of the public sphere and social media and discourse on social media, I think, is a key part of that. That, to me, is a primary terrain where a lot of this stuff is reproduced. I think it's also reproduced in the kind of common sense thinking that a lot of the organized left brings to its political praxis. Um, it might seem counterintuitive to draw a link between the way some of the left has thought about the war in Ukraine and left anti-Semitism, but I think there is a link through this idea of campism, that you can, you can split the world into a kind of discrete, there's the, there's the camp of imperialists, and then there's everyone else, and everyone else in, you know, even if the, the anti-imperialist camp includes, in, includes Putin, that it has some kind of progressive character. And if you have that kind of campist worldview, which again, I would argue originates in Stalinism, then um, I, I think that has some potentially anti-Semitic implications for how you're thinking about um, the, the sort of the origins of Israel um, as, as a state. Um, I think the final thing I'd want to say uh, on the question of how this is reproduced and to talk about a phenomenon that I think is important in, in, in this. Um, we've talked about Israel-Palestine a lot. That's necessary. I think all of us would agree, on the panel would agree that a lot of how contemporary anti-Semitism on the radical left and more generally is uh, manifest is, is around framings around the conflict. However, something that was notable about the stuff in and around the Labour Party is that a lot of the worst, most egregious instances of anti-Semitism, and you can read the leaked report from the Labour Party's governance unit if you want to see all that stuff evidenced in detail, a lot of the worst instances bore a very tangential connection, if any connection, to any definitive political argument about Israel-Palestine. It was actually a resurgence of this more primitive, cruder, primitive, Rothschild, Soros, Jewish bankers, Jewish finance, Jewish money power. Sometimes that would, it would, it would, um, it would have contact with discourse around it. So you'd, you, you know, you would read things like, Israel is a Rothschild banker state. That, that's, not a that's not a criticism of Israel. It's not, it has nothing to do with Israel's policy towards the Palestinians. It's not a criticism of Israel in any rational sense. It's an um, eruption of that kind of primitive reactionary anti-capitalism. Um, and I think that that's an important... I, I don't want to downplay the kind of Israel-Zionism aspects of the discourse because they're important, but it's also important to acknowledge how much there's been a resurgence of the primitive form since the 2008 financial crash, again, I think the conspiracy theories around the pandemic have turbocharged that. And so I think the left needs to be alive to this stuff. And I'll, I'll finish on this point. I probably, unfortunately, I, I don't have time to respond to the other questions. Um, uh, I think this is where this... this I mean, I, I share Keith's um, slight discomfort with, you know, the kind of crude... This, the first they came for the Jews, the, either the assertion of the kind of primacy of anti-Semitism. But I do think it is the case that anti-Semitism does have a potential to toxify and corrode political and social life more widely, precisely by strengthening and consolidating this kind of conspiracy theorist mode of thought, um, which is a very reactionary um, and, and kind of uh, disempowering uh, way of looking at the world. So I do think we have to be alive to the ways in which that stuff has been particularly reproduced in the, um, in the recent period. So Thank I, you. I just want to sort of respond to Daniel there briefly, which is I would probably, although 
I mean, you were arguing that both things were the case, but I, I would play down, I think, the ideological nature of, of well, generally, of actually what happened in the Labour Party, let alone the anti-Semitism stuff. It was there. But I think if you look at Corbyn himself, and a lot of it did come from the people who felt they were acting in his name, whether or not he wanted them to act in his name, it, he's actually not much of a Marxist. He's a, he's a very instinctual kind of politician, which can sometimes be a good thing with some people, but can sometimes be an absolutely horrendous thing. I actually think that in some respects, if the Labour Party was actually taken over by Marxists, even if it was those campus mar Marxists, there would have been a little bit more... <laughs> it wouldn't have been like punching the air all the time. There'd have been a solid thing that could go one way or another that you could either turn it round for good or turn it for, turn it for evil. But actually, a lot of what was going on was so, I'd almost say libidinal. It was, it was this sort of, I wouldn't say primitive, I don't like that term, but there was something about what was going on within the Labour Party that was, high, was almost primal in the sense that there was, it was to do with hope and desire and bitterness and disappointment on all sides. And that's not antithetical to a more consolidated ideological world world view but i think it the ideological thing there was the minor note i think i think it was the more the instinctual stuff that was actually more important because that was more important for corbyn himself okay uh, thank you on that note again i have to summarize this and end because please don't worry if you have more questions comments there's food and there's an idea that you have food. Please do have that food. I'll explain the context of food and then have discussion here. Uh, so, okay, a few things I was noticing. And we, of course, this is just one of the events. We could not cover everything. And I'll just share with you some. How many of you understand Urdu or Hindi? Anyone? Okay, there's a term called Yahudi Sajesh, Jewish conspiracy. It's a very common term. And you talk of conspiracy, you talk in this context. I mean, the number of times I've seen on social media and heard even from some students, the whole term, of course, they'll not say it very publicly, but they will share it with you if you don't think, if they don't think you're Jewish yourself, right? Is the whole idea of Yahudi Sajish means Jewish conspiracy. So why is Pakistan having its economic problem? Yahudi Sajis. Okay. Why is Taliban coming to power? Is the Jews behind it? Who's behind the protests in Iran? Jews. Who's behind the mullahs? Also Jews. So Jews are behind everything. Now, I know this is a, we can laugh about it, but you can imagine, and in that context, of course, they don't have the history of Europe in terms of the systemic anti-Semitism that has led to mass violence and camp in the past. But when you talk of how, for instance, the current debate on Israel-Palestine, then idea of Palestine being a Muslim issue, even though it's not a Muslim issue, comes up, you can see why we do need to also tackle other forms of anti-Semitism, including amongst let's say, religious minority in the UK context. I have personally experienced a lot of shyness from doing it and almost justifying it by saying, but you know, they're not the real one. The real ones are the white Europeans. So we need to be thinking of that. Of course, uh, I'm glad Keith talked of settler colonial project and in terms of how the problematic aspect of it, because one, the clear part is there has been Jewish presence in that region. So parts of Israel could be settler, but it's not settler colonial in the traditional sense. And of course, if we talk of Israel as settler colonial and want to boycott it, etc., why not boycott half of the nation states that are themselves based on violence and expulsion of people? I mean, that's what we talked of. That's I gave example of China, India, Turkey, because that's my direct research interest. Similar kind of behavior. In recent times, there's focus on Israel and in India a lot. In fact, I keep getting requests from PhD students from different parts of the world that they want to look at similarities between India and Israel. It's fine. I mean, you want to look at it, great. Because, of course, the way the far right now and even the parts of Netanyahu, you know, Netanyahu's best friend is Narendra Modi. And even now they signed a treaty, or sorry, they gave contract for a port to Adani, which is now going down, Adani is going down. They have all kinds of dodgy relations, but that's there. However, the reason I mention is because the singular focus in India and Israel is because, of course, they see India and Israel as non-Muslim, oppressing Muslims, Kashmiris and Palestinians. But they never talk of China vis-a-vis -vis Uyghurs. I don't get that. I mean, if you want to do that, why not look at that? It's not done. Or, of course, not of Turkey vis-a-vis -vis Kurds. And that's where we could see, I would almost say that as an Islam, not Islamophilic, but almost an Islamist or Islamophilic agenda there. But we can talk of that later during maybe a chat. What I would want to end with is, of course, the thing you mentioned is, 
why is anti-Semitism, let's say, not taken seriously among the anti-racist progressives? Because we're not talking far right or right wing here, right? And we're talking them. It is quite painful. We also have to think of to what extent, I don't know, you'd know more, is to what extent other forms of racism is also dealt with equally seriously by those who are fighting anti-Semitism. Because the most painful part is, and this is how divide and rule functions, is to put Jews against Muslims, Muslims and black, black against white, black and brown, Asians against this. And what is the way in which we can come up with a more inclusive progressive politics which recognizes specificity of bigotries but also finds the commonalities? Two things, uh, food part and also being recorded, but I can still say it. We try to organize, it's a kosher food, and for the first time I was organizing at larger scale, what we found, again, I, I, it's okay, I'm being recorded, that's fine. What we found was the cost attached to it. It's so expensive. I mean, now, the first reaction, really, is that expensive? Okay, fine, we'll do it. But the thing for me to think of is that if institutions want to be inclusive, right, and not want to have to ask you, are you into kosher food, halal food, this food, that food, you know, because we, it's difficult to manage. If you want to say, why not have all halal, or all halal, we have tried it, it's not expensive. All vegetarian, we have tried, not that expensive. Vegan, we have tried, not expensive. Kosher is like much more expensive than maybe eating out in one of the, not very expensive, but one of the expensive places. So that tells us how, and this is something we have to do as institutions. We have to challenge that where do not make simple cost of organizing an event where you want kosher food that expensive that you'll think twice. We're not thinking twice, by the way. This is just the beginning. We do have an event on 29th of March. We'll send it to you also, though, if you're registered here. It is on a launch of a report by Lord John Mann on anti-Semitism in higher education. So he will be in conversation with me. And he, in this room, we'll have other people also. The reason, of course, I, I was speaking to him, I said, look, it's not enough talk of those who already know what anti-Semitism and you know, challenge it. But what of those who are skeptical and think, but that's not seriously a problem? How do you make sense to them? Now, that's part of it, but all I would say to you all and those who would watch, it, uh, watch us later is, look, this is a struggle, this is a conversation. We don't get it right. No institution can get it right. We can't say, oh, now we have had an event on anti-Semitism. Wow, we are now anti-anti-Semitic. Great, let us be happy about it, right? It's not that. We do know these are the practices that have been continuing and that will continue. So we, as an institution at Westminster University, we are very committed that we explore with everyone, including you, whoever you are, what are the other things we can do? We might not get it right all the time. But what are the other things we can do to continue to challenge all forms of prejudices, all forms of bigotry, all forms of racism, and all forms of anti-Semitism? So we need your help. The way, of course, we can offer you help if you need space here, if you need partnership here, and if you have ideas and you want to share ideas. On that note, let me thank where is Zahra, the one who helped me organize, and Victoria. So please, please give a round of applause to her. She did most of the hard work, by the way, so I didn't. Now, of course, the three speakers here who did most of the talking, I also did talking, but they're the crucial ones here. Double applause for Daniele, who introduced me to the other two speakers, please, there. And the two people there, Tio, uh, Tio and uh, Leon, you can say hi, because for us, okay. And remember, it's, not, it's over time, it's extra time for them. So all I would say is, look, at Westminster, you're more than welcome, but let us keep working together to challenge things. And on that, please do the, that's a QR code. We do need feedback. No, ultimately how f institutions function, we need your feedback to then justify more funding to do these events. But not a fund, ignore the funding part, sorry. Uh, Leon, I think you can disconnect now because I'm talking funding. No, just do it because it, we would like to learn from you. And please join us for the reception. Thank you so much once again.